to say anything to start? Or? Uh, no, just um, yeah. thank you all for coming this evening and braving the elements. Uh, yeah, I find it's very helpful to have a lot of input and interest in projects like this. It really helps guide it along. Uh, Lucy Gibson is. Okay. Uh, Lucy Gibson is with Dubois and King. They are the selected consultant for this project. Um, they were selected through, we, we received a grant for this through the Trans Bike and Pedestrian Program uh, to assist with the funding. Um, Dubois and King was selected as the consultant. Um, Lucy and her team have been looking at existing conditions through the corridor. And I guess, first of all, the corridor is Main Street from the roundabout to um, Route 2, and it also includes Ferry Street from Main Street to the Rec Center. And the purpose of how to get all into this. Yeah, I'll get you with that anyway. <laughs> Why don't you <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Corey. And thank you all for coming. And welcome, people. And there's a few housekeeping. There's a sign in sheet near the front. Please sign in and leave your email if you want to get more information. We'll be in touch with you as the study goes forward. There's also a couple handouts that you don't need quite yet until later in the meeting, but they're on the table as well. So, so we've been working through since last winter on the study that's looking at Main Street from Elm to Memorial and then Berry Street from Main to the Rec Center. And you can see kind of the area on the map. I know this, the distance you have isn't ideal for the slides, but we'll do what we can. Uh, we have a project team that includes an advisory committee that's made up of a number of members of the Montpelier Transportation Committee and Montpelier Alive and the City Council. And then we have the staff, Corey Lines, been the city's project manager, and along with Kevin Casey from the planning department. And then the consulting team is Du Bois and King. I'm Lucy Gibson, I'm the project manager. We also have Sophie Sauve and Julia Ursaki who both are Montpelier residents, so we have been to the territory and are getting to know it very well. And I come here often enough, but they're here every day, so. Uh, here's a project schedule. As I said, we started in January. I know you probably can't read the words, but that goes from January to the next January. And we're working our way through looking at existing conditions and developing alternatives. Those orange triangles along the bottom are committee meetings that we've had throughout. We've had two so far, three so far. And then we've had a public meeting earlier on around town meeting day where we had input and um, got a lot of input on what people's concerns were. And then the next blue star in the bottom row is tonight's public meeting. And then we'll have one more public meeting to wrap up the project, which will be most likely at a city council meeting if we can get on their agenda. So what we want to accomplish tonight for the next, hopefully, more like half an hour, not too long, because I know people, I value the time you're spending here, I'll be presenting sort of the information that we have so far and the alternatives that we have developed. And I'm happy to take questions as we go along, and then we can also you know, break for questions a few times during the presentation. And then we're going to have what we're calling a workshop input where we actually have the options we've drawn up on posters at the back of the room and we'll give you some different ways to give us input. I'll get more into the details on that later. And then if people are still here, you can filter off after you've given your input, but I'll also go over the next steps and contact information. In fact, I think I'll do that at the end of the presentation. So one of the things that we've been getting up to speed with is all the past work and studies that have been done in the city. A couple that have been really kind of foundation documents for our work are the Montpelier Bicycle Pedestrian Plan. It's called Montpelier in Motion. I'm sure it's on your website. It was done in 2015, so it's pretty recent. And then another one is a, called Greening America's Capitals. It was a project that also looked at a lot of areas within our study area and looked at options that would make the city more vibrant, more environmentally sustainable, and had some really neat ideas that we want to be looking at in this study. And then there's even some longer ago studies we've been unearthing and looking to inform us. One was a study of Memorial Drive and Main Street, and it looked at options like a roundabout, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
there's a traffic study that was a very detailed look at traffic flow and intersections, and I think that was done during a time where there's a major parking garage planned and other changes. And then uh, the old bike path studies as well of the bike path that's now getting close to getting under construction. So this is the map that uh, was developed in Montpelier in motion, and I know it's a lot of different colored lines. The area that we're studying, Main Street and Berry Street, is a black line, and the, uh, the legend, which I know you can't read, says needs further study, so that's what we're doing now. But it does help because it has a lot of the network, what will the bicycle network be around the area that we'll be connecting to. And then the Greening America Capitals will show some of the snapshots of the plan, but it was basically looking at re it's sort of transforming both Main Street and Berry Street with a lot of um, better pedestrian facilities, more trees and plantings, more stormwater management using plants and natural systems and, and some other ideas that were developed. Um, and this was three years ago now, in 2015. And I talk a little bit, we're talking about some roundabouts a couple times. These are two drawings from the Greening America's Capitals report. The left side is the Main Street, Berry Street intersection. Main Street's going up and down roughly and Berry Street comes in and then the extension that will be potentially built as part of a development project as well as a new bike path are going up from Berry, uh, Main Street. That's a the concept they had was a full-size roundabout that actually the railroad tracks go through the middle of it, so it did take a lot of right-of-way and have a pretty big footprint. The other roundabout that they looked at was one at State and Main Street, and that's on the right half of the uh, drawing. So we've been definitely bringing those concepts into our thoughts, because one of the things about our study is we're not just looking at biking and walking, but we really have to look at driving and the intersections and how they all interact. So we've been looking a lot at each intersection in detail. And I just wanted to you know, have you know these concepts were kind of brought into the study and we looked at them and made, made some changes to them. So I'm going to go quickly through existing conditions. So it's not the most exciting, but uh, what we've been looking at and finding. And obviously, we want your comments if you think we're wrong about any of these things or there's more information we need to know but we're looking at infrastructure and how people are using it the volumes uh, safety and crashes and then we did get a lot of public input too as our first public events so um, Montpelier is really very walkable and people really seem to enjoy that and treasure that and walk a lot and in general the city is already pretty walkable and the kinds of Additional changes are relatively minor in scale. There's dealing with some ADA um, access and <coughs> community issues, and the condition of sidewalks is always a constant concern, and the city does a lot to keep up with them. And then a lot of its crossings and crosswalks and that kind of thing are really where a lot of our, um, in, our research has been on what we might want to change. And by a couple of Montpelier, I'd say the city's got some great bike path started, but then getting through downtown is a little challenging. There are, you know, there's a gro growing network of bike paths, but a lot of gaps in it that we're seeing people, you know, riding on the sidewalks or kind of riding, having to ride right in the middle of traffic. So that's probably more of the, there's a little more catching up to do in biking rather than walking is a, I guess, a general point that we're seeing. So here is the, um, infrastructure the city has for biking. Um, any of the dark lines are either bike lanes or the bike path. And I know you can't see the difference in the color, but that's on the left side. And on the right side is a the best data we have available on how many people bike and on which roads. And you can see there's a lot of biking right through downtown. Those greenish lines and the thickness of them is um, an indication of how many people bike. And yeah, you know, there's a lot of people having to bike where there aren't, where there's not infrastructure. And again, it's kind of the where the red circles are. That's the gap we're really looking at. How do you connect some of the bike routes to the north of town to the main bike path and some of the other bike lanes? We're looking at traffic volumes. 
one of the things that we think about when we're doing bike planning is in order to provide a bike facility that feels safe and comfortable for a wide range of people and not just the confident people, we have to think about how much vehicle traffic are they exposed to and also is there parking, on-street parking, that people getting in and out of their cars also kind of hinder or can intimidate biking. And so we're looking at that to think about what kind of bike infrastructure is needed in different parts of the town or different parts of our study area. So in this uh, diagram, Main Street's going sort of diagonally up from Memorial up to the roundabout. And the color is a traffic, you know, scale to traffic volume. And this is vehicle traffic. So the redder areas have the highest volume down to the greener areas with the lowest. So if you look at the lower part of Main Street where it's in the red zone, that's an area where we want to have a little more protected bike lanes and not just a marked bike lane next to traffic. Where if we get up to the upper part of Main Street, volume is a lot lower, so a regular bike lane is probably adequate for most people to feel comfortable riding. So we're definitely looking at that. And another traffic-related thing we're looking at are the intersections and what kind of changes might be done at the same time to you know, both help walking, biking, and driving. There's two intersections that meet the triggers in terms of volume to have traffic signals and stall. And one is Main and Barry Street. That's probably not a surprise to everybody. We've heard a lot of input that something's needed there. And then Main and School Street, so up above the State Street intersection, also meets the warrants, what we call them for traffic signals, although so just barely. So it's not as clear of a need for a traffic signal, but it would be something to consider at that intersection as well. And this is a map showing dots where all the different crashes have been happening. We have been taking a close look at the crash data. This is available from VTrans, and it's over a five-year period from 2012 to 16. That's the latest they have available right now. And uh, the darker blackish, brownish dots are where bicycles and pedestrians were involved in the crash. So this is other data we're looking at to understand you know, what the patterns are and where the needs are. And Main Street between State and Barry is kind of a hot spot for the biking and walking crashes, definitely, and for vehicle crashes as well. Will these slides be available online? Yeah, we'd be happy to put a. Yeah, yeah of course. Okay, we're actually re recording this. You're also recording we'll post it, it on the website. Others so to watch. If you have neighbors, if you have people that could make it tonight, they'll be able to watch right. and then comment as well. So, another thing that we did was ask people. You know what their experiences are, where they're concerned, where they are, think there's a need for a change. And we had town meeting day, we had a table out, got a lot of input, and that's just the map that was produced from it. And the red dots are things that are of concern, and green dots are things that people like. So you can see a pattern of Main Street, and Main Street go, uh, goes sort of diagonally up and down on the south side of the river. And you can see Main and Barry had a huge number of red dots. A fair amount at Main and School and State and Main. People like the roundabout at um, Spring and Main Street, and then also the four-way stop sign at Elm and Spring Street. If I have my names correctly. And then we supplemented that. I won't spend too much time on this, but we did an online mapping that we had open for a month or so that allowed the same kind of input online for people that could make it. And that combined with the town meeting day input really shows the same pattern with a lot of concern of Maine and Mary being probably the number one issue. And then a lot of good comments all along. And then a lot of comments along Barry Street, really almost more than Main Street. So that definitely helped guide us for what kind of priorities we had. So some of the key takeaways, and there's a lot of data, we probably can include it on the report, but Barry Street was in very high concern, and a lot of it was related to conflicts between people driving and parked cars more than people biking and walking. And that's between getting out of driveways and not being able to see, and then driving along the street in the winter, especially when it gets a little narrower with the snow and feeling like you're going to take off someone's mayor, mirror or your mayor is going to get taken off your park there. So those were kind of the biggest issues we heard about. Main Street and Barry Street was like the number one hotspot and a lot of comments that 
some kind of traffic control is needed, either a signal or roundabout. And for crossing Main Street, that location is really feels unsafe and challenging. Um, State and Main Street was not quite as much, and some people thought it worked well, other people were concerned, but um, there's general feeling that for bicycles is pretty tough, and the waiting time for people walking is also annoying, and people then walk without signal and <coughs> reach habit. <coughs> School in Maine was another hot spot, and the crosswalk there was um, jail too long. By the time you start, the cars are coming, but by the time you finish, and speeds are a little higher there. And uh, a, also an encouragement to look at traffic control at that intersection. There was a lot of interest in doing a four-way stop at Spring and M. And we did look at that, and I'll get into it a little later, but it really doesn't, the traffic volumes and patterns are really different, so we don't think it would work at that location. So taking all that input, our next step was to look at alternatives and some of the key things that we thought about is pedestrian safety and comfort was probably one of the most important things to both maintain or improve and then to provide what we call a low stress bike network through the study area and that means something that uh, people who are not confident riders feel comfortable with so protected from traffic if there's high traffic. Um, we want to maintain, well, looking at traffic circulation, we're looking at how each intersection operates and how they work together. Um, trying to maintain as much parking as possible because any discussion of bike lanes can affect parking. And then just considering all the different users together to try to develop some recommendations. So that was our intent and we really want your input tonight on if we have that right or what more needs to be done. And I'll go through some of the design elements that we use so when we talk about bike lanes or protected bike lanes you have an idea of what we're what we are talking about so i'll go through a few of these it's roundabouts and mini roundabouts you have one roundabout so you know what they're like but the concept of a mini roundabout is a little different so we want to talk about that there's shared lanes and sharrows bicycle lanes buffered bicycle lanes um, and protected bike lanes i'll go through kind of the spectrum um, there's one of the tools that we looked at was converting some of the diagonal parking to parallel to get more room for bike lanes and fewer conflicts with biking. Another thing that's been, um, especially in the greening, the capital report was to convert the head-in diagonal parking to back-in diagonal parking. That can also be safer for bikes and um, bike boxes and race pedestrian crossings. So those are some of the tools that we are using so to talk about a roundabout versus a mini roundabout, this is a slide from Manchester, Vermont. And it's not ideal with the view <laughs> to show both the roundabout and the mini roundabout, but there are one of each in the slide. The roundabout is on the left near the top. And this is a, what used to be called malfunction junction. Terrible traffic, it works really well in terms of traffic since the roundabout went in. And then over on the right side, it's a little bit screen by a building roof is a mini roundabout and the difference is it's much smaller and it doesn't have raised islands so if a large truck has to go through it can drive right through the middle of the intersection it doesn't have to negotiate around a tight turn can you tell us where that is on that slide it's on oh the upper yes right i think corner. i can uh, i'll try using the pointer here i go up there if i could so, I think I shot. Whoops. So I'm going right to the middle of the roundabout. You can see it's partly the mini roundabout. It's partly screened by the roof, but it's kind of a bumpy textured thing. But a truck can go over it, and it's sort of otherwise like a miniature roundabout. So, and it for that intersection, you really, if you have one roundabout and Another intersection that close really also has to be a roundabout in order for traffic to flow through and not get backed up. So that was kind of a, and it was a very tight spot with you know a lot of old buildings like what you have on here. So a mini roundabout was the answer that worked in that spot. Yeah. Do you do you know what the reaction has been of the um, first responders, particularly the fire department, with these kinds of roundabouts? Well, they're definitely designed with that in mind. 
Because I know the one here in Elm is a real problem for the fire department. So, yeah, so I guess we, you know, I think that was one of the first, that was the first roundabout yeah, in I the state. So. And it, I think it has an issue because it's pretty tight, yet it has the raised island. Yeah. I think if that was being done again today, it would be done with a mountable yeah. island because that's, um, you know, a much, it's, it's almost too tight for large trucks. I think have it's right, right input, on the edge. Have you had input from the fire department thus far? I haven't, no. So I think that'll be something that we'll yeah. be looking for their input in the next phase as well. Thank you. But many roundabouts are designed for any large vehicle to get through, when, including fire trucks. So. so here's a few other examples of roundabouts. The, um, the lower right graphic just shows a truck making a turn right over a mini roundabout that's in kind of a downtown area. And so that's, when we're looking at any of the intersections of our study area, we thought really a mini roundabout's the way to go. They're, they work well for the vehicle, the motor vehicle, passenger cars, but they also can serve the trucks more easily. And they take up less room. And when we have the old architecture here, that's really probably the most important reason. Now, one thing, however, to keep in mind when we have roundabouts and we have bike lanes um, is that the way they interact is that, and there's a diagram on the left, I don't know how clear it will be, but if someone's traveling this way on the bike lane, there's a bike lane at the you know, lower part of the street, when they get up to the roundabout, the bike bicyclist has to either decide to ride through the roundabout in the middle of the traffic lane as if they were a car, and the more confident riders do that, or they can bail out and ride up on the sidewalk and then ride around the roundabout, and that's how they're designed. And so one of the concerns in a place like State and Maine, it's, there's not a huge amount of room, so you would have bicyclists getting onto the sidewalk and mixing with pedestrians. It'll probably be at slow speed. It's not a fatal flaw, but it's something, something to think about. And, you know, if you have a lot of pedestrians bikes will really have to get out and walk their bikes, so it doesn't make that continuous network for the less confident riders. But so these are, there's a lot of different types of bike lanes, and we're using a number of different types in the plan, so this is kind of a diagram showing the range. Let me get that thing out of there. So from the far left is just a shared lane where bikes share the lanes with traffic might have share or markings. I know you have some of them cropping up in Montpelier. Um, just riding on the shoulders, the next one over, but then next over from that is a bike lane where you have a four to five foot or more dedicated lane for bikes alongside cars. The next over is a buffered bike lane where there's a painted buffer that gives you just a little more room and comfort. And these are all giving riders increasing comfort, especially in conditions where there might be increasing road traffic. Um, the next one over is where you have a parked car and you want to have the bike lane on the outside of the parked car so they're more separated from moving traffic. Then you need an additional buffer for people that are opening their doors from the car so they don't trap the bike in a tough spot. So that's the protected bike lane with the parking. Um, the next one over is where you have a raised bike lane next to parking, which is just kind of a variation. And then the last one over is um, a cycle track with a hard skate barrier between the two. So these are all different you know, families, but again, different ways to get the comfort and safety to be higher. Um, so one of the designs we're looking at here is a parking protected bike lane. and because of cost and stormwater and right not just on the same surface of pavement. So this is a design guideline that's now used commonly for that, where you have the parked cars and then the painted buffer and then the bike lane all on the same surface of pavement and then the sidewalk beyond that. So that's one of the types that we're you'll see in our plans. Then another thing that we're looking at how to incorporate our bike boxes a bike box is a place that would be at a signalized intersection and it's painted green. Cars are not supposed to be waiting on it when they're stopped and it allows a bike to slip by the parked cars and get out in front. 
and that's really helpful if they're trying to either make a left turn or if they're the bike lane's ending and they want to get out ahead of traffic or a number of different cases where they're really helpful to for people to um, feel like they have a place in the road and they're protected again from moving cars. So there, you see those at a few of the intersections here. Um, angle parking, there is some angle parking in the downtown and we looked at could we have a bike lane next to it and what we found is there's really not room so the angle parking we have is pretty much incompatible with having bike lanes both in terms of space but also because they're because people are backing out blindly they're really particularly hazardous for biking so any questions so far moving along good so now I'm going to talk about the alternatives that we've come up with for Main Street. We looked at Main Street and then Berry Street separately, and the two alternatives among the two can really be mixed or matched. So um, they're not, they don't have to be paired up. So, and again, because we're looking at both the intersections and how they operate in the traffic, we are looking at both, you know, signalized or roundabout intersections and bike lanes. So we have start with M1. The first Main Street alternative is traffic signals with bike lanes, where we add a traffic signal at Berry Street, we'll go into it, and um, have parallel parking where there's room. The next one is roundabouts with bike lanes, so that's converting the intersections to roundabouts, which gives a little more room for more parking and bike lanes, because you don't need the turning lanes of the intersection, so there are some advantages to that, but, you know, pros and cons. Uh, the third one is we're calling it a hybrid. It's some roundabouts and some signals. And then the fourth one is an alternative where we really relied on the Greening America's Capital Report. And because that didn't provide bike lanes on Main Street, we looked at an option of trying to get bike lanes on Elm Street. And we'll get all into these in detail as we go. Um, as I go through and explain these, I'm just showing you the different segments that we looked at or that we'll zoom in on, uh, starting at the bottom. So Main Street's going up from Memorial to Elm. We're looking at or Spring Road. We'll look at um, first Memorial to Berry Street, then Berry to Langdon, right through State Main, and then from Langdon to the library, which has sort of different conditions, a little more width, and then the last section, the library to the spring. So, as we go through, that's kind of the order we'll be looking at. Okay, so this is just a diagram of the existing conditions as we've drawn them. There might be a few tweaks here and there, but from of Main Street from Memorial to Berry. So just kind of for reference, and again, the, some of the issues were the crossing at Berry Street was deemed quite challenging. There's plenty of uh, concern or conflicts around the Shaw's entrance and visibility and people blocking the sidewalk that are not very easily solvable, but we certainly are aware of them. There's a bus stop right in front of Shaw's as well. And one of the things that we understand is that now that's a very busy bus stop. A lot of buses stop there. Some of them wait for a long time. When the one Taylor Transit Center's done, it'll be much less used, so those conflicts will likely be less of concern. Up that side. It looks like we have you, you put a crosswalk uh, on the Shaw's uh, parking lot side of Barry Street. Which, is it on the other side? It's on the other the side right? okay. now. I was is that a yeah. suggestion or is that? No. Okay. So here is the M1 option, which is traffic signals with bike lanes. <coughs> so a couple things that we're looking at doing, and maybe I'll try using this. Um, for the, basically the section in front of Stonecutter's Way and over the bridge, we looked at the traffic volumes of how many are turning, and we think that that left turn lane can actually be kind of shared, realigned, because right now there's a full left turn lane, the whole length to Memorial Drive. And the way the light works, you get about seven or eight cars out, and then the rest of the people have to wait. So we have enough stacking to get more than that many cars out, and also a lot of left turns into Stonecutter's Way. 
and then we have a shorter left turn lane into Shaw's, which doesn't, as far as we've observed, never backs up too far, so it will be enough capacity for those left turns. And that gives us the, basically the width of an extra travel lane, because right now it's basically four lanes across the bridge to get bike lanes on each side. So that would be a, you know, really with just free striping a way to get bike lanes all the way out to Memorial. And then we have a bike box out there to help people who might be riding up the bike lane to turn left or go straight even. And then a traffic signal at Berry Street, which would have bike boxes, because again, the new bike path will be you know, coming right in around here. So there'll be probably a demand to turn onto the bike path in either direction. And then what you'll see on to the right side here in order to get bike lanes, we need to take parking off one side of the street. So and we, I'll, t I'll give the numbers of how that looks later on. Did you also look at eliminating curb cuts in I mean, that area in particular? It's just kind of a wild west. That would be a wonderful thing to do when it's kind of a... But that wasn't part of well, your analysis? Well, we haven't, you know, at this point we're looking at the broad range of options, and I think in the next stage of our study, we'll drill into some of those additional needs more, and then, and that will really affect how much parking is too, because every time you have a driveway. But and so at this point, we're not really, we haven't gotten those details, but it's definitely something that is important to address. And we have a limited amount that we can do in this study, but we can either you know, explore that option and also make recommendations. Kind of a chicken or egg problem. You assume you have to have the curb cuts that the drives are designed to waste. Yeah. If we could get rid of some of the curb cuts, we'll Yeah, that would do a lot. And it, for both biking and walking and parking, <laughs> I've never been done this. So, and we heard a lot of complaints of some of the alleyways that would conflict with people walking. That's definitely something that we'll be discussing. So here's the option, it's roundabouts with bike lanes, and this includes you know, fairly larger roundabout because of the high traffic and that there's more room at Memorial and Main. And then a roundabout at Main and Barry, we've done a, and I'll show in the next drive, it's a mini roundabout, one of the smaller kind, rather than what was done for Greening America's Capital. And then you can see the pinkish line near Barry Street is the coming in from the north is the bike path that's under construction or soon will be under construction or on its way. And then our Berry Street options, which we'll be getting into later, but continuing down Berry Street to the rec center. And then you can see on the right, and you'll see more on the paper, that we can fit parking on both sides of the street because the roundabout doesn't need the left turn lane. So. Lucy, question for you. You should have asked it while you were talking about roundabouts. Um, can you speak to about the um, manner in which a, a visually impaired pedestrian can locate a roundabout, a crosswalk and a roundabout in the Hawk signal system? Say that again, I'm sorry. For the visually impaired to locate oh. a crosswalk right. at a roundabout, find the crossing? So, well, they're, they're our design, they're considered accessible if it's a one lane roundabout because the person who's visually impaired needs to Across one lane at a time. And the larger roundabouts would have two circulating lanes, and therefore two lane approaches are not really, uh, I mean, they build them and they're done, but they're not serving visually impaired people well. And so, and one of the other options at any of, like at this roundabout, is you could have at the crossing, which would be right there where that pointer is, you could have a, a pedestrian beacon that would start flashing for visually impaired people to use, or anyone could really use it. So that could be combined if there's any concern that the design isn't adequate. So there's a locator button as yeah. well as an indicator in the traffic? Right, yeah. Yeah, it would be a, like a rapid flashing beacon would probably be the thing that would, so, but yeah, that's definitely something that needs attention. Is, is the roundabout at Memorial and Bay and one or two lane? Just one lane. Just is what we looked at the numbers, and that's more than adequate for. And you can fit it in the space without yeah. buildings 
It will be a little bit of impact on the edges, but not, you know, not unreasonable by any means. Did you look at the, the study that was done by Howard McCullough? We did, yes. He had two lanes in there, didn't he? And that was, well, that's a good point, yes. So that was done at a time where there was a huge amount of development and they projected a lot of traffic growth that they indicated needed a two-lane roundabout. But when we look at the actual numbers, we're really hobbling along at not much growth. And even with some growth, our look can, you know, there's also, I think there's just more conservative analysis done then. And now with more experience in roundabouts, we have a more refined way to say, do we need one lane or two lanes? So we feel very comfortable that one lane would be enough. Yep. whether they need to go to gates or not, but it would really not be much different other than the traffic's moving. So, and actually, well, let me go to the next slide because this is a little bit of a close up and I can actually, so where I, my pointer is, is where the railroad would cross what we're proposing as a mini roundabout. And I just showed the diagram on the left, which was from Greening America's Capital, where they had a much larger roundabout where the railroad actually cut through the middle of it, and then you kind of stop traffic on either leg of the roundabout. And that's, you know, one option, but we feel that many roundabouts are really a better fit for the urban area. It'll be lower cost and whatnot, so we would recommend considering a much smaller footprint that then can be out of the railroad. So. This is something we haven't worked out all the details either, but at this stage, but so that definitely. So about does that very main, or the mini does not have a crosswalk on the Shaw side? We're correct? thinking probably not on the south side because it'd be right over the railroad tracks. So it would have crossings, maybe if I go back to the other. So there'd be crossings on the north, well, I'm saying north, up uh, to the right and to the south but not on the approach that goes right over the railroad, just it was probably too tricky. And again, these are very conceptual, so things could change a lot if any of these really move forward, but this is where we are. All right, and then, okay, and then the hybrid option was, um, as we have talked about some of these deals, there's a lot of interest in the mini roundabout at Maine and Barry, but could it work with the signal? And, you know, I think it, it would most hours of the day. So here's a hybrid option where the main and memorial is signalized and Barry and Maine has a mini roundabout. And the only concern for this kind of thing is there during peak hours when there's a lot of traffic backing up from memorial, it, the roundabout will get a little bit locked up. And people won't be able to move. You know, no one will be able to get out of Barry because there'll be people waiting there and maybe waiting backing up from the state as well. But on the other hand, is that any worse than what's there now? And you know, the rest of the hours of the day, it should work pretty well when there's lower traffic and not standing queue. So but that's definitely a, you know, one of having them both signals means they can be tied together and traffic can kind of pulse out more easily. So yep. in, in, with the mini roundabouts, do people at high traffic volume, do they tend to end up stuck in the in the circle itself, uh, or do they stay back from that? So that, for instance, here, if, if they stayed back from it on on Main Street, then people on Berry Street could execute a left turn. Yeah, and you'd hope you know if people are courteous. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> the problem we have yeah, now. And, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, in some intersections in New York City, there's a big X, it's a box out. Right. For, you know, and, and you can be fine if you're stuck in the middle. Yeah, um, and I think that, you know, that would be, we can hope people will, and because it's a low speed environment and there's, you know, generally people are pretty courteous. There's always a few jerks out there, but, you know, I think that that would probably 
people would likely not want to block roundabouts they're stuck. One of the real challenges with roundabouts is that, particularly in the U.S., a lot of people are not familiar with how to use a roundabout, and I think we've seen that happen out at Route uh, 302 and 2. You've got people stopping, you've got keep people blasting through, so I would think there has to be some sort of, if we were to go the roundabout route, some sort of education with people as to how they go through these, okay. these roundabouts, particularly if you have bicyclists going both ways, that could be a real danger to the, uh, the rider going straight or cutting to the right or the left. Right, right. So, and that's a good point, yeah. I mean, there's more and more roundabouts around the country, and, and just you do have a, a couple here, Vermont. but you yeah. probably see the just best not of the a worst. Lot of Vermont, yeah, so. right. So, and that's the, uh, I guess the other point is that, you know, there'd be bicycle routes around the roundabout as well as the option of riding right through the middle. And we assume that people going on the bike path to the north or west, whatever, would probably you know, wrap around cross at the crossing and then wrap back in. Okay, so now we're going to go from Berry Street to Langdon Street, which is more right through the heart of downtown. This again is the existing pavement markings. And, you know, we, one of the things we have to look at, there's a lot of crosswalks along Main Street in front of City Hall. Are they both needed? It's hard to say yes or no. They're both certainly used, and we don't really see an issue with keeping them in. They don't seem associated with crashes and whatnot. So that's kind of a little bit more of a discretionary um, call for now. We assume they both could stay there, certainly. And then the state and main intersection has the sort of um, funky crosswalk um, arrangement where you do, you're kind of missing the diagonal gap between right in front of city center to say right the Howard Bank. And um, so those are some things that we are looking at, uh, how those could be addressed. And then the other thing we heard quite a bit about, and now we'll get into it. So is the Langdon Street crosswalk, which is very much on the very edge of the drawing. Um, the concerns are that, let's see, I'll go to the, these aren't the greatest photos, but basically traffic's often backed up through the crosswalk. So one danger is if people are crossing and there's cars waiting, the cars in the other lane can't see them, and so it really exposes them to potential risk, which especially for younger kids or people who can't see so there's definitely safety issues with it. There's also issues of traffic getting through the intersection at peak hour and then having to stop again or feeling like they don't want to stop because they don't want to hold up all the people behind them and kind of put people in this dilemma. So there's definitely been a lot of concern about it. There's also been like a thick folder of different studies and emails and reports that have been discussed. So it's kind of a thorny issue. So we'll, we'll put out our ideas that we have on it and we'd love your input on these. So what we've identified so far are really three different options, and we've incorporated them into the different M1, M2, M3, but they can definitely be mixed and matched, so um, they're not exclusively assigned to that. But So M1 is to, there's two yellow lines. Those are potential locations for new crosswalks. M1 would be to move the crosswalk further from State Street to um, Hazen Place, which is a little alley, and it might be in front of the alley or near the alley, depending on parking and other issues, but somewhere in that location, it'll really still serve the same desire to get to that block of Main Street. It gives a little more space to um, be a little further away from the intersection, but it probably won't solve every problem, but it should be sort of measurably better. Then the other option, M2, is to make a whole raised crossing. This was a, inspired by the greening the capitals, and I'll show drawings of what these look like in a bit, but that will hopefully make more clear areas so there won't be that backed up traffic. Hopefully people wouldn't stop on the raised crosswalk so the pedestrians would have a lot more visibility. And then the third option, M3, is to basically get rid of the crosswalk that's 
um, between East State and State and move it up there and make a bigger intersection area. And that will make it more convenient to get from city center over there without going too far out of the way. And it also would allow the signal to operate differently where there'd be less delays. And that's one of the objections people cross at Langdon rather than at State Main is the long wait path there. So it would address some of those. And I'll we'll show a little more on this. Okay, these are pros and cons. I'm not gonna get into these too much yet, but they're all written on these handouts, so later on we can... Um, Again, uh, just back one slide. The, yep. the, the southbound lane of Main Street at Langdon would be another place for a big X, because if you keep that area free, it's just the southbound lane, right. then you have visibility, you don't have problems with yeah. left turns on to Langdon Street. I mean, it right. solves a lot of problems. Yeah, and that, you know, that could be a cheaper way to do it, and yep. that's the same idea, right? It's making it more of a whole open area. So, anyway, there's some pros and cons with each of these, and we'll want your thoughts on them, but I think for now we'll keep going to interest of time, and you'll get to weigh in on the end. So. So here's the M1 signals and bike lanes. So if there's a signal at Berry Street and a signal at um, State Main. And one of the things we're showing, which is really something that can be done with paint or something more textured, is just um, reinforcing the whole, all the different crossing options that would be possible with the scramble signal, which is the kind of signal where all the red lights go on and then pedestrians can go every which way. And to allow that kind of diagonal movement as well as part of that, because that's something that, you know, otherwise you'd have to really do the two movements and it's not, nobody does it, so it kind of recognizes how people are using it. Um, there's parking on one side of the street. We chose the upper side, so the west side of Main Street. It could probably be worked out to be on either side, but that seemed to allow more parking saved. And then here's the roundabout with bike lanes. So we have the mini roundabout at Barry and then the mini roundabout at State and Main. And again, that allows parking on both sides and then the bike lanes are on the outside of the parked cars so they have that protection. And then they'd have to kind of choose what to do when they get to the roundabout. And then we're showing the sort of wide open area at Langdon Street, which yes, could definitely be paint or something more less expensive. This was envisioned as being kind of raised and textured. And I just want to talk about the state and main roundabout. That uh, this was, the diagram on the right was from Greening America's Capitals and we kind of replicated it on the left. And it's a mini roundabout, first of all, that wouldn't, nothing larger would fit. But because of the offset intersection, the way they designed it requires anyone coming in from East State cannot get into the roundabout. So that becomes a right turn only approach. And I don't know if that was really discussed much <laughs> in the report, but it really would have a big effect on traffic control, accessibility and whatnot. So that's a big negative with this and there's really no way to get that lane safely into the roundabout. We kind of tried a lot of different machinations and that's really what <laughs> the best we can do, we think. I'm gonna skip over that one. All right, so here's the hybrid option, M3, where we have the mini roundabout, and then this is where we pushed the crosswalk to the north side of East State Street, so that then you could have the crossings happen at the same time as the traffic. And there's some details on that I won't get into, but it would make the intersection cycles quicker and actually be better for cars and capacity and it would make the waiting time less. But you do have the pe you know, people turning right have to yield with the pedestrians, which is a pretty common scenario in most places. So. And then the section, the next section is from Langdon Street on the right up to the library. And School Street, we uh, 
this is the existing condition. There's a diagonal parking. The road widens quite a bit here and bends, so there's probably history for that. Uh, the main and School Street intersection was a big hot spot. Um, the difficulty crossing, because you're crossing three lanes, there's a left turn lane, and traffic's moving a little more, especially sometimes in the day. And we did look carefully at the numbers for traffic control. It does meet a signal warrant, so it could qualify to have a signal put there. And that would help the crossing, because they would have that protective phase. The, the idea of putting the all-way stop really doesn't work, because there's way more traffic on Main and way less on school than the intersection of Spring and Elm, which were much more balanced. So we looked at the two of them side by side. And those numbers at Main, at Spring and Elm work really well for a four-way stop, but this would not. And so we don't recommend that. But um, So M1 is signals, so we could put a signal there at these the way it's laid out could be signalized or unsignalized. It really doesn't have a, could be go either way. And all the parking, the diagonal parking is converted to parallel. And then there's plenty of room to have the bike lanes outside of the parked cars for a good part of the way. And then eventually it's towards the right as you go north on Main, and they become regular bike lanes. So, and here's another option would be a mini roundabout at, um, school in Maine, it fits really easily within the curb, so it would be a relatively inexpensive fix. It would slow down cars and provide a good crossing for pedestrians. Otherwise, similarly, the bike lanes go through, the parking's all parallel. And then the last section from the library up to Spring Street, we um, basically bike lanes, well, this is existing, so there's parallel parking now, and it kind of becomes unmetered as you go further north and on one side. So for really all of these options, we didn't see much. You know, we're trying to stick within the existing curve, so we weren't trying to widen the road or anything. It would just be conventional bike lanes along the traffic lane instead of a parking on one side. So we're kind of redistributing that space. And the volumes are lower and whatnot, that this is a good facility. And then, you know, eventually, the bike lanes take her into the roundabout and then they're making transition to the next next section. And then M4, which we kind of sketched out, is based on the Greening America's Capital, which doesn't have bike lanes on Main Street. It has shared lanes. And so because we're intending to really try to make that low stress bike route, we looked at Elm Street as an option for um, having a more protected bike lanes. So we've taken a close look at Elm Street and how could that work and you know, it has right now two-way traffic and parking on one side. So either it's take out all the parking and put bike lanes or another option we want to put up for discussion is making Elm Street one way and then there's room for a two-way bike path on one side. So along the bottom there's a cross section where from left to right you have the buildings and the sidewalk, a parked car, the one-way direction moving car, and then a buffer and then a two-way bike lane. So that would be something that could fit in that without losing all the parking. So one way into town or out of town? Well that's a that's a whole other discussion and it could happen either way and yeah. there's pros and cons so um, that is definitely another big disruption to the uh, traffic flow. So this is just kind of what it looks like. I'm going to skip over this slide. So these are different options. You could have it go south, and then you're sending more traffic in the yellow lines through State and Maine, which is congested and not great. Although in this whole option, that's a roundabout, so that does help with that. But you know, it puts more pressure else. Any one-way street kind of puts pressure somewhere else. We're assuming it would be two-way north of school because that's such a long route for people to get around and having bike lanes on um, upper main is relatively doable. So, and then going the other way, then you're putting pressure on that direction. Um, so there's pros and cons of each, and we have a, it's up for discussion if this alternative even goes anywhere, which is probably. All right, and here's the summary of pros and cons. I'm not gonna go into it because we have it on your handout. So for Berry Street, 
a little bit simpler. We looked at three different options, and this is Berry Street between the rec center and the uh, Main Street. One is to, to a shared use path, and I'm just going to get right into them. So basically, what you can see on the bottom is the cross section. You'd have parking on one side, two travel lanes, and then just widen the sidewalk to be a shared use path. So you have walking and biking mixed. And that's sort of consistent with the shared use paths on either side. So that's kind of a nice thing about this is it makes that um, more seamless. You do lose one side of parking. The other option that something that was recommended in the Greening America's Capitals, and it could also be something that can be done much more quickly in the short term, is basically similar. You have parking on one side, two travel lanes, and then you squeeze in a two-way bike lane on the pavement, road pavement, and then the sidewalk. So this is all something that can be done with paint. And it's the concern is it's a little tight, so it won't resolve the conflicts with people feeling like they're going to run into parked cars for at least the side that still has parking. And with both those options, would that then connect through the alley at the rec center? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So we've kind of, that's our destination. Yeah. And there's be some yeah. improved crossing there to make sure. But this would be on the north side of Berry Street because of the driveways. And, and then a third option, which we think probably is not going to be too popular, is taking parking off both sides and putting comfort bike lanes. So, which would be low cost in terms of paint, but it would be fairly big parking impact given it would go from two sides to no side but it definitely addresses the the concerns we heard a lot about which of parked cars so those are the options and uh, pros and cons um, so we've looked at parking and again we don't have this in final final design form but we've done enough to have a pretty good estimate of where we think parking would be so on that chart the existing is on the far left and it's about 120 spaces with the M1 which is traffic signals it would go down to about 60 well, at the loss of 60 so kind of cutting it in half of just those streets so this is the on-street parking on Main and Barry and not you know we're not affecting any other parking there's lots of parking on the street the M2 the roundabout option boosts up the parking a bit because you can have parking on both sides for some of the streets and the M3 is similarly about the same the M4 option has more parking because they maintain, they don't have bike lanes on Main Street, so it, we lose it on Barry Street, but not on Main. And then we've also looked at traffic operations at all the intersections to just give an idea. So this is a chart showing delay at each intersection. And I know it's probably hard to read, but the, the flumps are Memorial, then Barry, then State, then School, so going up. And then the different colors, green is existing, M1, the traffic signals is orange, M2, the roundabouts is yellow, M3, the hybrid is pink, and M4, the green capitals is purple. And the quick story is that um, maintaining signals at the intersections and putting a signal at very, the higher the number basically is, the worse it is. So, we like to have the lower bars where we can. Roundabouts, which is the yellow option, has the lowest delay overall. However, the traffic signals will be um, you know, tweaked. And this doesn't count some tweaking that we could do for the signal timing, but um, nothing really gets worse than it is now, I guess I could say. I won't get into too many details, except for, well, School Street and the the greening caps when we accounted for all the traffic winding around and getting rerouted, that also kind of took a hit. So I'm going to wrap up there. Any more questions before we get into it? traffic rather than creating separate um, traffic bike lanes. And I ask that as an avid 
people feel comfortable um, and also accommodating or avoiding the conflict with motors. Yeah. I don't want to dominate that, but I, no, I, I, I understand where you're coming yeah. from, where you just want to kind of go. Yeah. I'm go a vehicle. Under, under Vermont state law, I am a vehicle and I should behave that way. And you'd certainly be allowed to ride, if the, having a bike lane doesn't require all the cyclists to be in it. So. I don't know, it's something we can certainly put some thought into, but again, the goal is to have that, get to the large group of riders who are. Question? One thing that, you know, well, of course, it's in our, in our transportation infrastructure committee is to lower the speed limits in town so that more people feel comfortable riding in traffic. As, a, as a, you know, maybe in addition to bike lanes, but if, if the speed limit were 15 instead of 25, more people could do close to the speed limit on a bicycle. Whereas at 25, it's, it's really impossible through town to keep up with traffic and to get comfortable with traffic. So it's definitely another thing to look at is, is lowering speed limits. We can lower low 25, can we? In the state. By state law? Yeah. I think we can lower it to 20. Yeah. In a designated downtown. Oh. And you know, the concern becomes can you enforce it or what kind of measures are you doing to make that follow? Because you can't force it. So great option, but certainly designing for lower speeds can be, and I think that's probably like the greening America's capital, they have a lot of traffic coming, a lot of texture and stuff that would slow people down and make it so be shared. The volumes are pretty high though, and it's again, would you want your kid riding, a 10 year old wouldn't ride there, yeah, so we're a little bit trying to design for a bigger range of people than would be comfortable. All right, well now, thanks for your patience. Sorry it took so long. We have, we'd like to get your input on the maps in back. We have a couple different ways we'd like to do that. One is we have these sheets here that give, these give pros and cons. If you want to provide more detail, and you don't have to do it tonight if you want to send it in later. Are there additional pros or cons, or do you have any comments on these or things that we missed? on these options. We'd love to get you to write them down and share with us. And then the other thing is on the maps themselves, because there's a lot of different pieces of these alternatives that can be combined in different ways. We'd love to get your input with, we have green dots and red dots. We'd love you to put green dots on things that you like and would want to see in a final alternative, because that's what we're getting towards, is coming up with the best solution that we can put together. And then red for the things that you don't like and would not want to see in the final alternative. Can't guarantee everybody's wishful. <laughs> there may be nothing left. But anyway, we did want to get a sense of the room. You've taken the time to learn about these. We'd love to get your feedback. And then we have room on each sheet to write any other comments you want us to think about for each option. So there's four tables back there, and it's M1, M2, M3, M4. And then they have the different Berry Street options, which really can be mixed or matched as well. So. Thank you very much. And what I'll do before, so we can kind of, I'll quickly do our next steps, which is we have a committee meeting. We haven't scheduled it yet, but it'll be probably sometime in October where we'll be bring, compiling all that we've learned and come developing a recommended preferred alternative for the report. And then we will get a draft of report and it'll eventually be presented to the city council. And then one other item that we're gonna be including in our report are some short-term things that can be implemented cheaply with paint and other easily obtained and removable materials so we can try some things out and not wait for as many years as it takes to get some of these things built. So that's definitely, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> One other sort of, maybe it doesn't fit in, but it's overarching question would be, are there ways that the, um, first off, what, what kind of traffic shows up on Berry Street especially coming into town and are there ways to reduce that further out so that you don't even have to deal with it at the intersection so well that's a good point we haven't really looked at the bigger demand we are aware that there's potential for growth and traffic from development and that might cause other people coming through to go a different way right. you know we think that if anything if we had a signal or a roundabout Barry and Maine, it might increase the amount of people using Barry and maybe decrease on East State if people are choosing to, 
benefits, there'll be an easier way out. Right. It could definitely shift traffic, and it's probably right. not. There are a lot of trucks that come through. Yeah, there are. A lot of, a lot of big trucks. Yeah. And they're coming down Berry Street every day. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we'll try to, you know, okay. consider those options as well. But. So, and then it'll eventually get presented to city council, we're thinking in December. Um, and there's certainly a possibility that some of there's grant programs or maybe some short-term implementations could happen maybe next year. And I'll leave uh, here is my email and Corey's email. Feel free to get in touch with us. Um, any further ideas? Yeah. Um, I just want to ask again, John mentioned it earlier, if, if these slides that we just saw can be online somewhere, that'd be great. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're going to wait. I want to share it. It's on Corey's on computer time. now, so. Yeah, the project has, a, we have a project website yeah. on the city website, okay. so we'll post both the presentation and the recording of right. tonight. And there's also going to be a place where people can comment, like you can back in the back of the room, so we'll leave that open probably for maybe a month or so. What will be your traffic convention projection years for traffic? We used I have to, I may have to get back to you, but there were some projections that were done in a recent study. It was a, what's that, a recent traffic study that was done that you know, included some amount of growth that's planned. But in general, the traffic has not been growing significantly. So we, and some of the other studies I mentioned earlier, we're assuming there'd be a lot of growth that hasn't been seen on the ground, and so we're. We're counting some growth, but not a surge of growth. So it's more than the current amount. Yeah. And it's, you know, the peak hour, so you're trying to look at the worst time of the day is when you do the analysis. Do you have any thoughts on it? Anything you want to make sure we include? Well, you know, we want to make sure that it's going to cover right. 10 years down the road or so, at least, probably. <clears throat> Although this isn't a great, great, big, big project. Right. I mean, one thing we're the intent is not to like widen state and main so everyone can get through as much as have to get the hikes and walking through. So, you know, we're definitely trying to accommodate what's there and what we expected. 